Thank you so much. So we're going to experiment a little bit tonight. I'm going to require some audience participation because we are going to talk about the economics of beer, beeronomics. And there's only one way to do that, and that's by drinking beer. So if you, if you received a ticket and you don't want to drink beer, give it to somebody who does, because we are not wasting beer tonight. And I don't know, this could be a total train wreck, but we'll see what happens. But beer is important to me for a lot of reasons. First of all, it's delicious, right? Does anyone like beer? Now, I know I'm in Europe, but I happen to like American beer because I think it's a metaphor for what free people can do when you take away regulations, when you lower barriers to entry, when you introduce new technologies. All of a sudden, you get things that you never would have imagined before. So I think it's a metaphor for everything that we're here to talk about. And I'd like to start by quoting the famous Austrian economist Hunter S. Thompson. Hunter S. Thompson once said, good people drink good beer. <laughs> bad people drink bad beer. We're going to return to that theme, but I have a corollary. It's, it's praxeology, it's science. This is not something we're going to debate tonight. But it is also true that free people make better beer and that free people drink better beer. This is just like downward sloping demand curves or diminishing marginal utility, Mises would say this is a praxeological fact not to be debated anywhere. We'll see what happens. I'm drinking right now an Anchor Steam. I'm drinking this particular beer on purpose. Uh, Terry and I smuggled it into this country from the United States. I don't know if it was legal, but we did it anyway. Have any of you ever had an Anchor Steam? All right. So you can get Anchor Steam now probably across the world. The first time that I drank this beer was in 1986. And I happened to be in Palo Alto, California at a conference put together by the then fledgling organization called the Mises Institute. Have you guys heard of this guy, Mises? Anybody? Ludwig von Mises was not there, he had passed away, but instead, I was looking at this glorious picture of this, this beautiful golden beer. It looks so different than the corporate beers that we drank at the time. And I was sitting at a picnic table with a guy named Murray Rothbard. You guys know this guy, Murray Rothbard? <laughs> now, it had taken me most of my young life to get to that picnic table because back in the day, there was no internet, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter. It was virtually impossible to find the ideas of liberty. It happened by accident. I stumbled across a rock album by a, a band called Rush that was dedicated to the genius of Ayn Rand. I eventually stumbled across one of her novels, and of course, if you read enough Ayn Rand, you'll discover that she says, if you want to understand economics, read this guy Mises. So like any strange 16-year-old, that's what I did, but it wasn't easy. You couldn't find this stuff. You couldn't Google it if you didn't think that you were agreeing with your Marxist professor standing behind the podium. You had to find it for yourself, and it was usually an accident. So by the time I was 22, and I'm sitting at a picnic table with Murray Rothbard, I had made it. This was the best moment of my life. I discovered for the first time that I wasn't the only libertarian in the entire world. It turns out that there were actually dozens of us. <laughs> and, and I'm not exaggerating. When I was a kid, there were dozens of libertarians, and you knew who they were, and you, we were all were super weird, and we would quote the footnotes from Human Action, and there were no girls. So look around the room and get a sense for how revolutionary and how exponential the growth is in the liberty movement today, because a leading indicator of a healthy social movement is when the girls show up. 
This, this is also praxeology, by the way. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and I'm talking to Murray Rothbard. Terry's there with me. There was a couple other people. And back then, getting an audience with Murray Rothbard just wasn't that hard, because remember, there was only two dozen libertarians in the entire country. So we're sitting around, and, and what do libertarians do back in the day? We talk about the non-aggression principle. We talk about it for hours, because that's what libertarians do. We debate whether or not it is moral to walk on a government-paved sidewalk, because that's what libertarians do. <laughs> I don't think the word minarchist existed at the time, but I guarantee you that we debated the virtues of anarchy over, over limited government constitutional capitalism. I don't remember exactly what we talked about because I was really digging this beer. <laughs> pitcher after pitcher of this beer came to this picnic table. I might have had more than a couple. And it changed my life. I could talk about the ideas that I cared about and I could drink good beer at the same time. So we're gonna try something tonight and, and we'll see if it devolves into a riot. The thing I love about the Liberty Movement is that we usually don't hurt people or take their stuff, right? But we're gonna raffle off some of these beers. If anyone would like to try an Anchor Steam, look at your ticket number, and I don't even know where the tickets are. Oh, they're right here. We'll see if this works. Do I need to read all these numbers? The last three. Last three? 587. Anyone have 587? If you do, come on up over here and we'll get you a beer. 562. 539. 415. 602. If you have any of those numbers, come over here. Get yourself an anchor steam because we're going to talk about that right now. We have a winner. So, so just just grab a beer and, and roll. I'm not recording. Okay. So anchor steam is important for the craft beer industry because this is literally the first beer made in the resurgence of the American craft beer industry. A guy named Fritz Maytag, who was an heir to the Maytag fortune, um, his grandfather made washing machines, his father made Maytag blue cheese. Um, Fritz was a young guy going to St Stanford in California, and the local brewery was Anchor Steam. Anchor Steam was about to go out of business because after prohibition in the United States, all of the local breweries that used to dominate American culture, usually immigrants from, from Europe, all of those breweries went out of business, and the post-prohibition era was characterized by big beer, big corporate beer that kind of tasted like piss. And I'm, who, who loves this beer? I, I know I've offended somebody here. There, sorry. I didn't mean it, I'm just kidding. But by the time that Fritz Maytag bought a bankrupt brewery called Anchor Steam, Anheuser-Busch, Imbev, and Miller owned 80% of the market share of beer in the United States. So people didn't actually know what a real, real beer tasted like, and nobody knew that they wanted it because it simply didn't exist, but Fritz Maytag was obsessed. He had a little bit of money because of his, of his family background, and he bought this brewery. He took all of his family inheritance and he poured it into this brewery without really thinking about it. He wasn't a businessman, but he was passionate about beer. This beer was different, this beer was awesome. Fritz Maytag was gonna bet his career and his reputation and even his relationships with his own family on whether or not he could make and sell Real, real beer in the United States. This is 1975. By 1979, interest rates in the United States were at 21%. He's borrowing money at 21% prime to put into a brewery with no proven market potential. There were no customers for this kind of beer, 
in the United States. He worked so hard that eventually he collapsed on the floor of his own brewery because he didn't think he was going to make it. He didn't think it was possible, and he knew at the time that his family, successful generations of business people in his family, were struggling to understand what the hell he was doing. They were laughing at him. They were mocking him at Thanksgiving dinner, and that just made him want to succeed even more. He knew that if he made good beer and he created a process by which he could get that beer to people that wanted it, that he could change preferences, he could change market demand, he could introduce customers to something better than that they'd had before. Now, as it turns out, Fritz Maytag is a libertarian. Google Fritz Maytag sometime. Watch an interview that he did with Reason Magazine. Um, Terry and I got to meet him many years ago at the Cato Institute. And this doesn't surprise me if you know his story. Well, today, of course, Anchor Steam is the baseline for all craft beer in the United States. There was a guy from California that drove down to San Francisco to meet Fritz Maytag because he had a beer like this. And he said, this is different. I want to have one of these beers. This is what I want to do. He was a home brewer named Ken. Ken started a home brewing company in Chico, California, before it was legal to brew your own beer in the United States. Now remember, after Prohibition, beer was a highly regulated, highly complex business to be in because of something called the three-tiered system, which really boils down to if you make beer, you can't sell it directly to customers. So it was illegal in 1979, 1980, to brew beer in your own house. In fact, people got arrested for this, believe it or not. And yet he op opened up a homebrew supply store because that's what he cared about. And he'd had this beer. And he, he went, went to meet with Fritz Maytag, and Fritz told him how it could be done. He was skeptical because he had had his own hard times. Of course, Ken Grossman, the next year, would start a brewery called Sierra Nevada. Has anyone ever had a Sierra Nevada? Beautiful, hoppy beer. I had my first Sierra Nevada pale ale a few years after my drinking session with Murray Rothbard, and I found this beer in a Grateful Dead parking lot. It, there was no distribution on the East Coast for Sierra Nevada Pale Ale in 1987, 1988, but the hippies that followed the Grateful Dead from the West Coast to the East Coast, they cared about real craft beer. It changed my life. If you've never had a hoppy American-style IPA, you need to try one, like tonight. Like, you got to go find one if you don't win the raffle here. Sierra Nevada Pale Ale changed brewing fundamentally, and it happened because Ken Grossman, despite the fact that his family thought he was crazy, despite the fact that there was no market for hoppy pale ales, despite the fact that you couldn't even buy the ingredients, it was a new thing in the United States, he decided that he was going to open a brewery. Now, remember, at the time, it's still illegal to serve your own beer to your own customers. There were no brew pubs. There was no way to get this exotic micro craft beer directly to consumers. You had to do it through the tier three, three tiered system. His family made fun of him. His neighbors made fun of him. It just wasn't going to happen. But he didn't give a shit because this was what he wanted to do. He cared so much that he drove from Chico, California, all the way up to Yakima, Washington, to buy a truckload of hops called Cascade. Cascade hops at the time was a new thing. This, these things didn't exist before, but it creates that, that floral, resiny, kind of pot-like aroma that you get in American IPAs. It's gorgeous. I mean, I, I think it smells like pot, I'm not sure, but I read that somewhere. So, Ken Grossman's doing this, and he's being mentored by the guy from Anchor's team. 
Ken Grossman today is worth $1.3 billion. Sierra Nevada is one of the largest breweries in the United States. And somehow, he got that beer to consumers in a way that never had been done before. Now today, if you drink a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, um, beer snobs in the United States would, would say, this, this isn't really much of anything. It, there's not enough hops in here. So in, in the US, we have a nuclear arms race to see how much hops you can put in a beer. Two of my favorite happen to be right here. This is a microbrewery called Three Floyds Brewing. Three Floyds is in Indiana, and they are famous for making beers that go about 10, 12% alcohol, and they have so much hops in them that they will melt your face. And we'll see this, I'll demonstrate it as someone tries one of these. So we're gonna open a couple of these and we're gonna raffle some of them off. If someone, would you wanna pour some beers? Sure. These, oh, they're already open. So these beers, by the way, you probably can't get in Europe, you can't even get them in most of the United States because their model is exactly the opposite of what happens with corporate beer. Three things happened to make this beer possible. First, they legalized home brewing. The guys at Three Floyds used to be home brewers. Second, they legalized brew pubs a few years later, state by state, starting in California, Washington, and Oregon. The reason the beer culture in those states is so vibrant is that it was legal to create a niche market beer that most people wouldn't want to drink. Most people, for whatever reason, don't want their faces to melt off because they're drinking a 100 IBU IPA that is so alcohol heavy that it'll kick your ass. But some of us do. Some of us think that that's pretty awesome. And the third thing that makes that possible is technology and social media. How on earth would you find a niche market, a community so fanatical about a beer that they will, they will trade it on eBay, they will, they will drive through three, four, five states just to buy a case of Three Floyds beer? How does that happen? It couldn't have happened in the days when advertising involved expensive TV ads and marketing firms and all of that. It, it happens in a peer-to-peer -peer world where maybe in this room there aren't people that want to drink this beer, but there is a community globally that will do anything to drink this beer. It involves voluntary association. It involves people coming together in a shared set of values. It involves everything that you and I believe in when we talk about the free market. At the long tail of the internet, you can get the music you want, and you can get a beer that tastes like this. So we got, one, two, three. We got a bunch of beers here. 661. 538. 660. Just grab and go. 576. I've already lost count. 412. Yeah, do it. 600. 417. 583. 638. I've now lost count, by the way, so. But we'll work it out. Anyone else got a ticket? Cheers. Sorry, everybody else. 
So I started, I started talking about beer about a year ago, and I started making videos about beer um, in part because it's been a defining part of, of my upbringing. I grew up in the craft brew revolution. It also happens to be a beautiful way to write off beer as a business expense. And that's, that's important as a startup organization. But I started thinking about this stuff when I noticed about a year ago that the country of Venezuela had stopped making beer. For a beer drinker, that's the most devastating thing you can read in the paper. I'm like, how is that even possible? How is it possible that a country like Venezuela, which used to be the most beer drinking country in all of Latin America, you could no longer get a beer in Venezuela. What do you think about that? So I started looking into it. Cerveceria Polar, which is the Budweiser Imbev of Venezuela, crony capitalism at its worst, it was the government sanctioned brewery. It wasn't owned by the government, but it was, it was sort of a, a fascist setup where um, if you wanted to brew beer in Venezuela, you needed permission from the right regulators. Cerveza Ria Polar could no longer get the ingredients to make beer. They couldn't get the barley, they couldn't get the hops, and they couldn't do those things because the government of Venezuela had spent so much money that they didn't have that the currency wasn't worth anything. No importer of the products to make beer would send products to Venezuela anymore because they wouldn't take the money. Now, the government of Venezuela, knowing that their currency would collapse if they started allowing importers like Polar to import those ingredients with American dollars, controls every American dollar. The only currency that works in Venezuela is dollars because the local currency isn't worth anything. So they couldn't import the ingredients. Nicolas Maduro, upon seeing this in the paper, threatened to put the CEO of Polar in prison. I think he may have actually. But how is that even possible that you couldn't have a currency, you couldn't import the ingredients, you couldn't make beer? Another famous Austrian economist, a guy named Frank Zappa, once said that you can't actually be a country unless you have a beer. It'd be good to have some nuclear weapons, it would be cool to have a football team, but you have to have a beer if you want to be a country. So on that very standard, Venezuela is failing. Well, of course, you guys have seen what's going on in Venezuela, and it really sucks there. People are getting beaten to death in the streets because people are stealing because they're so, they're so hungry. On average, Venezuelans have lost 17 pounds apiece because there is no food. Moms can't get food for their babies. There is no toilet paper. There is no nothing of nothing, so much so that they were all flooding into Colombia, neighboring country, to get food for their children. Nicolas Maduro and his Marxist professor who advises him decided to close the border to Colombia, not because people were leaving, but because real Marxism, real socialism, doesn't work as long as, as these capitalist profiteers in, in outside countries are coming together. People are starving to death in Venezuela. So let's suggest a theory that I have that if you can't produce a beer, if you can't buy a beer, the cost of making a beer in Venezuela has gone up 6,500%. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds like a lot. It doesn't sound like a viable business. The cost of beer has gone up three times since Polar announced that they couldn't produce beer anymore. So the bottom line is you can't get a beer. Socialism sucks really bad. And if I was gonna be in a socialist country, I would want some beers. I'd want a lot of beers. I would need to drink a cold six pack to just take the edge off of the fact that, that all of this human suffering 
is being imposed because of some stupid ideology. So I bet you if we applied this standard, how many beers are there in socialist countries? At best, there's one. Maybe there's none. Maybe things get so bad that you can't get a beer in these countries. Versus countries that are free to do whatever it is the hell they want to do. All these micro markets and all of these, these niche communities can create whatever kind of beer they want and they can sell it to whoever they want in hopes that there's somebody out there that loves a beer just as happy as that one. Turns out there are. Couldn't have happened without technology. It couldn't have happened without this process of distributing power away from centralized authority. Let's call it big government. Let's call it big beer. Let's call it big media. Let's call it big education that always put the Marxist professor behind the podium that told you what to think and you had no recourse but to write down the crap that he was saying because you couldn't Google it. All of those top-down structures are collapsing before our eyes and they're shifting power back to the end user, power back to consumers, and that means you get better beer. That means you can get any kind of beer you want, and it means that people like Fritz Maytag and Ken Grossman and the guys at Three Floyds can create whatever they want in hopes of finding or creating a customer base that would actually like share the same values that they do. Well, this, of course, is the market process, right? This is what Frederick Hayek would talk about when he talked about the spontaneous order, the potential of all of us with our own personal knowledge and preferences and values living in our, our own communities and our families and all the goals that we have that are unique to us coming together to find something better to create something better, to do things that no one thought was possible before. This is where the good stuff comes from in a free market economy. But we struggle to tell this story, don't we? We struggle to explain what's going on with free markets, and usually because we're dorks, we get out spreadsheets and we're like, look, demand curves slope downward. Why don't you understand what I'm talking about? Beer is a better metaphor, I think. I don't know. So because we are libertarians, and because we, we tend towards following things to their logical, extreme, radical conclusions, I sought to find the most ridiculous beer that I could find in the United States. This is, I guess it's an imperial stout. It's made with, with chocolate and all sorts of crazy stuff. It's 19.5% alcohol. <laughs> to give you context, a typical bottle of wine, 12, 13, 14%. So if you say yes when I call your number, understand I have no legal liability for what's going to happen to you. I gotta have a little bit for myself, though. Yeah. Perfect. I probably need to wrap up my speech soon if I'm gonna drink this, because things could get weird. Okay, 601, 410, 595, 408. <laughs> See, it's fixed. 405. Again, you have to sign a waiver before you drink this. So this is a new brewery, it's called The Brewery, and it's based in Southern California. And their model is fundamentally different than anything Sierra Nevada did, certainly anything that Anchor Steam did, because they will produce one beer, one time, it's a very limited production, 
They will sell it, people will buy it, people will actually line up to get a hold of a beer like this because in craft beer culture in America today, you can never go too far. Enough is never enough. 19.5% alcohol is the new normal, and we're gonna see just how far we can go. We're gonna see how many exotic ingredients that we get in beers, and it's beautiful because nobody in their right mind ever said to a producer of beer, I want a 19.5% imperial stout made with chocolate. But they, but they created a marketplace for this. I just lost my beer. They created a marketplace for this, and it's just this beautiful, disruptive thing that's going on in craft beer culture. Entrepreneurs from all walks of life, they tend to be 18, 19, 20 years old. They're brewing nano breweries in their basement, and they're trying everything that they think they want to do. I love it. The final beer that we're going to open tonight is the new Agoras Brewery, Pax Pale Ale. Oh look, there's a quote on the side. Where there is commerce, there is peace. A guy named Jeffrey Tucker said that. <laughs> this is an anarcho-capitalist freaking beer right here. And I have an assignment for everybody. You gotta to go to newagorist.com and you gotta check these guys out. They are crowdfunding capital to launch their brewery in Southern California. They don't have any permission, they don't have any licenses yet. He's not allowed to sell me this beer, he had to give it to me. But he's going to launch a brewery that looks not so different from, I'm gonna butcher the name of this. What do you call the Crypto Anarchy Institute here? So, so imagine last year I went to this place and I bought a beer with Bitcoin. It was just the most beautiful thing in the world. And I'm like, and I, th I think that's that's the future. The goal of these guys at New Agoras Brewing is to create a brewery and to make some really interesting and exotic beers, but also to create a space where we can talk about ideas, to market the ideas of liberty, literally on the side of a beer label. This is the future. You're gonna to have to use Bitcoin to buy these beers. I assume they take Bitcoin as, as investments. But we're gonna pour a couple of these now and we could even have readings from the side. This is Gravitas Whiskey Raisin Oatmeal Stout, made with chocolate and spices. And there is a quote on the side. We must make the building of a free society once more an intellectual adventure, a deed of courage. A guy named Frederick Hayek said that. When is the last time you read a Hayek quote on a freaking beer? This just doesn't happen. But it's about to happen now because Andrew believes that there is a marketplace for people that like raisin oatmeal imperial stout and reading Hayek at the same time. I think a couple of these people are in this room right now. This is the future. You can't do this stuff without freedom. You can't do it without technology. He probably will get to a point where we're not gonna worry about the distribution system, we're not gonna worry about the rules that would limit not just the production of beers, but who you can sell them to, because there's this thing we're talking about, right? It's a peer-to-peer -peer economy, it's a permissionless economy, it's an ability to find people all across the world that want what you have to sell, and you don't need to go lobby your state government to get permission anymore. All you need is freedom, and blockchain, and Bitcoin, and technology, to do things that no one has done before. My favorite economist, Ludwig von Mises, the guy that I was reading when I was 16 years old, the guy that I would quote and, and chase all of the, the girls away with, 
In, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what happened with you, baby. Yeah, there was beer. Mises in Human Action talks about entrepreneurship. And Mises' view on this is very different than other Austrian economists, other neoclassical economists, because he says that entrepreneurship is a question of judgment. And look this up. This is probably, I think, my favorite part of human action and really the essence of what makes freedom so awesome. An entrepreneur is somebody that sees the future differently. We all see the past about the same. We all know what happened yesterday, but it is the entrepreneur that kind of looks around the corner of history and sees an alternative future. There's this great quote where Mises said, the masses are free to laugh at the entrepreneur, but the entrepreneur charges forward. The entrepreneur doesn't give a shit. Mises didn't say that, I did. Because this person is obsessed with something. It's a little bit like my iPhone. How many of you knew, maybe you're too young to get this question, but how many of you knew that you needed an iPhone until Steve Jobs told you you needed an iPhone? There was, there was no consumer demand for smart technology because people didn't even know what it was. It wasn't available to them. And Steve Jobs, who, who was, by all accounts, kind of a, kind of a jerk, right? He was, he was kind of an asshole. He was obsessed. His own company fired him, he was so obsessed. But he knew that people wanted this if they had an opportunity to do that. Fritz Maytag, in 1976, he bet his family fortune. He, he told his wife that we may lose everything we had. Everybody laughed at him, everybody made fun of him. He created an industry that didn't exist before, the craft industry. You do that not because you're looking for a higher marginal return on your investment. You do it not because you're a slave to customer demand. You do it because you want to do something that no one's ever done before. That is the essence of entrepreneurship. That is the essence of what makes freedom work. And this is our opportunity, I think, to talk to young people that don't think about Ludwig von Mises. They don't read quotes about Frederick Hayek. They're flirting with socialism. They're flir flirting with nationalism. They're looking for someone to solve their problems for them. In the United States, you guys tell me if this represents the views here in Europe. We have this guy, Bernie Sanders, who was, who was seducing young people with this idea of democratic socialism. Bernie Sanders, of course, had all sorts of glowing things to say about Hugo Chavez when he was redesigning Venezuela to the point where it is today. Now, he's an unreconstructed Marxist, but he's redefined it now. It's democratic socialism. How do we tell the story of liberty to people that are flirting with socialism? You look at the data in the United States, a lot of young people say, I like socialism better than capitalism. But then you ask them, well, do you want the government to own the means of production? We're like, hell no, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> Why don't you believe in capitalism? Because that's where big government and big business collude to screw the small guy. That's where Budweiser lobbies for new distribution laws that prevent the young upstart from making a double IPA from his garage. So all of these definitions are upside down. Socialism in the American context doesn't mean what's happening in Venezuela. It means people working together to solve problems. That's what we believe. That's who we are. So we need to figure out a way to connect with a new generation. And I think it's the same reason why craft beer is working. It's got to be technology. It's got to be social media. It's got to be getting rid of party bosses and top-down structures that used to tell us what to think and what to do, shift power away from the incumbents back to the end user. This is our biggest opportunity. When I was 22 years old, drinking beer with Murray Rothbard, there were dozens of libertarians in the United States. How many do you think there are now? 
Someone throw a number at me. Hundreds of thousands. Wrong. You knew I was going to say that. Our audience is millions and millions and millions of people. And part of it is we've got to shed the language. We can't have new arguments about the non-aggression principle. Nobody knows what the non-aggression principle is. Nobody knows what it means. And, and frankly, nobody cares. We have to tell human stories. We have to connect on those common values, one of which is the right to do what you want as long as you don't hurt people or take their stuff, right? You say that to your friends, and they're going to say, yeah, that sounds about right. And then you're going to say, you know, that's a libertarian, right? And they're like, no, what? I don't even know what that is. What is this L word you speak of? Our audience upstream of politics is millions and millions of people. Anyone with a YouTube channel or a Facebook page or a Twitter handle, this is who we need to be talking to now. And we have to appreciate how big this opportunity is. Let's get upstream of politics. Let's get to the point where those of us, I haven't poured this beer yet, oh my God. I was about to close it out, but we're gonna pour these beers. Libertas, double IPA, with a quote from Albert Camus. 658, 404. We're sort of out of glassware, aren't we? We'll use these guys. Four oh three, four oh two, five eight eight. Which one you want? Thanks. Pour more than that because we're running out of glasses. Okay, so where are we going to go with this? I don't know. I've kind of run out of words. I think the... What should we talk about? See, I told you once I drank that beer. The opportunity that I want you guys to leave with we're all this sort of special club, libertarians, and, and we, we have these arguments within our family about what's a real libertarian and what's not a libertarian. I want you to think about the potential of talking to millions of people. How many of you here you do video now? You produce your own videos talking about this stuff? How many do like Facebook memes, that kind of thing? Yeah, you guys, you guys love this stuff. How many people yell at each other in the comments on Facebook? The reason that Terry and I left an organization that we had founded called Freedom Works to start Free the People was this very huge opportunity that I think we have. And I worked for Rand Paul and I worked for Gary Johnson and we did a lot of political stuff, but I don't think that we solve saving the world through politics. I think we do it in the culture. I think we do it by reaching people in the very long tail of the internet, the same place where you can find whatever music you want and whatever beer you want and whatever ideas you want. Think about the potential of reaching every single person that believes 
that you shouldn't hurt people or take their stuff, what if we reached all of them on social media and brought them in to a community that represented liberty? Do you think we could change the world? Are you guys optimistic or pessimistic about this? Don't, don't be pessimists. I can tell you that regardless of who is the President of the United States or who is running this country or your country, you gotta look upstream of politics and there, freedom is trending. Thank you guys so much. Cheers. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kibi, in your last video, um, uh, Beer is Freedom, when you talked about Michael Moore, you, you, you told that uh, American beer is better than European beer. <laughs> Don't you think that you're lying to yourself? So my, uh, my belief that American beer is better may involve pandering to my American audience. <laughs> but let me, you know, here's what's interesting, and I think I think you see a trend here. Um, how many people here like Belgian beers? I love Belgian yeah. beers. Um, Belgian reds, Belgian sours, doubles, triples, quadruples. We've probably been to almost every monastery brewery in Belgium. But if you go to California to one of my favorite breweries, a brewery called Russian River. Russian River was the, the first brewery to create a double IPA. It's called Pliny the Elder. If you ever get your hands on a Pliny the Elder, do not share it with your friends, it's too precious. But they make, they make sour Belgian style beers that I would argue are actually better than Belgian beers. And so the technology and the know-how and the traditions that started in Belgium came to the United States. We played with it, we messed with it, we disrupted it, we probably broke rules and did things that we weren't supposed to do, and we made different style beers. Now if you come back from that Cascade Hops in, in California, brought down from Yakima Valley that made the first Sierra Nevada beers, and you end up in Belgrade, where Petar, I'm talking about you now, he, he took me and Terry to a brewery in Belgrade last year, um, a startup by a guy named Vladimir, and the first thing Vladimir showed me before we had our beer was he had a, a refrigerator full of fresh hops from Yakima Valley. He was making that insane hoppy beer that I actually thought was better than an American beer. So I love the fact that everybody steals everybody's stuff and they disrupt it and they change it and pretty soon the next best American beer is going to be made in Belgrade. How's that for a political answer? Thank you very much for your speech. I, just a short question. What do you think of the purity law that we have in Germany? The Reinheitsgebot. So, do you guys know the history of the German beer purity laws? It was supposedly to make sure that the beer passed a certain regulatory standard. As it turns out, it was Bavarian princes screwing over beer producers in northern Germany. Because in northern Germany, you didn't just make beer with hops, malt, and water. You put things like fruit and spices in your beer. So it was protectionism. And it was designed specifically to, to screw over the competing beers coming from northern Germany. Today, I think it really stifles the, the innovation in Germany. A lot of German beer producers would complain about this, so much so that one of my favorite breweries from California has invaded Germany. Stone Brewing built a massive new production facility in Berlin, and it's because people aren't free enough to make crazy-ass beers in Berlin, and customers in Germany, just like every place else, are interested in experimenting and doing different things. In Franconia, we had such great beers uh, before the uh, before the, the Reinheitsgebot, 
We, we put mushrooms in the beers. We put all, all kind of herbs into the, be uh, be uh, uh, into the beers. And we also, uh, and it's also like a government dictate because the wheat was taxed 30% and, and it is just a, a, a scheme to, um, to exploit the, the, the people and, and, and the beer drinkers. If, if you did hard work, uh, they punished you with that thing and, and the, all the government propaganda through centuries took the German people to like inher inherently being proud of, of some, some, some kind of regulation and it's, that's very evil. I think it's very evil and we have to, uh, we, we should get rid of this uh, Reinheitsgebot. Because it doesn't make the beer rein. So one, one thing that I wanted to talk about, and I, I agree with all that, and, and I'm glad you filled in the blanks because I'm not an expert on, on German regulations, but what's fascinating about the disintermediation that comes with technology is it used to be that community was very geographic, right? Your community were the people that, you, that lived next door to you, they're the people that spoke the same language, they're the people that were on your team versus the guys in a neighboring country. That was community back then. Today we crowdsource community, right? We, we can find people like us. We can come together on some sort of common value, pretty much regardless of where people are from, what language they speak, what color their skin is, what their ethnic background is. And to me, the same thing happens with beer, right? Most people don't want to drink the beer that's in my hand. Most people want to drink a light lager and it's awesome and, and that's the sort of beer that, that certainly German beer usually sort of represents that. But if you can choose your own community and you can find a common set of values and you can come together, um, you can do anything. And I think that's a metaphor for where we are today in terms of uh, the nation state, in terms of trade, in terms of migration, in terms of all these things we're fighting about today, I think that peer-to-peer -peer technology potentially has a profound impact on our ability to get there. Probably not the answer you wanted, but I'm drinking. Any other questions? All the way back there. Who's got the mic? Are we done? We're a bit short uh, with time, but this will be the last question if someone could can you take the question? Uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what is your favorite song by Rush? Who, who loves the band Rush? Anybody? My favorite album is not 2112, it's Farewell to Kings. And everybody should Google the lyrics to Farewell to Kings, the song. It, it, it represents everything we believe as libertarians and against the state. So that's, that's my favorite song. Thank you guys so much.